Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Joseph Ludu. He is the Henry and Lucy Moses Professor of Science, Professor of Neural Science, Professor of Psychiatry and Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at New York University. His work focus, focuses mostly on the brain mechanisms of emotion and memory and he's the author of many books and today we're going to focus on his most recent one the deep history of ourselves the four billion years story of how we got conscious brains so dr ludo thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show it's a pleasure to everyone thank you for having me okay great so it's interesting that in your book you go step by step in evolution to try to explain uh, how we got conscious and where consciousness appeared in evolution. And you, you start with, um, I mean, basically where in evolution behavior starts. So what, what, when can we say that behavior started in evolution? Well, um, let me just say a bit about the book first and then I'll answer if that's okay. Sure. You know, I wrote, I wrote this book, um, I would say maybe half or maybe even two-thirds of the book I wrote as a science journalist rather than an expert because I didn't really know about the details of you know, the evolution of life and so forth. It's a complicated, uh, fascinating history. Um, but you might ask, why did I even bother with that? What, what took me to the beginning of life? Actually, I start the, the, the whole process uh, with the Big Bang because all of the chemicals on Earth um, that we have, the whole periodic table, is stardust from the Big Bang. And so those chemicals ultimately came together in ways that, uh, you know, in a, a kind of miraculous way that ended up making life. I don't want to sound religious about it, but uh, the, the, it was, you know, billions of years of like raw materials that just got, have to come together to do the, the right thing, uh, starting with the Big Bang. But anyway, uh, the reason I, I wrote the book and got started on it was because I had been studying, you know, Pavlovian conditioning, so-called fear conditioning for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I, I decided it's, it's inappropriate to call it fear conditioning because we have no idea what an animal is experiencing. So I've changed the terminology for my work at, uh, to be threat conditioning. So a threat CS, a threat condition stimulus, will elicit freezing behavior and changes in blood pressure and heart rate and release of stress hormones. And I call those defense responses because they're protective. They're, they allow the organism to protect itself. And those def defense responses are not controlled by an amygdala fear circuit, but by a defensive uh, survival circuit. So with that kind of logic, I started asking, you know, we, we discovered all this circuitry uh, in, I don't know, the, the early, late 80s, early 90s, in terms of how the CS and US get paired and how the learning takes place. And from there, we then started asking, what are the molecules involved in this? And so we had some clues from people like Eric Kandel and others who had studied invertebrate organisms where it's a bit simpler to study these things. And so we tested those molecules that they uh, had, had discovered in the simple nervous system. And sure enough, in terms of in, both in fear conditioning and spatial learning and a bunch of different tasks that people have used, it turned out that the um, molecular mechanisms in mammals were similar to those that have been discovered in invertebrates. Uh, so how how does that happen? Well, that means that somewhere in the history of the vertebrates and the classic invertebrates that we that we think about, like snails and octopus and crabs and flies and bees, that there's a common ancestor that sent those genes in both lines, both directions. So that common ancestor uh, is known to be a flatworm that existed about 630 million years ago. So that's how mammals and uh, uh, bugs got their common genes. But where did that flatworm get them? Well, it turned out that the, uh, its ancestor, which was a kind of jellyfish-like organism, or perhaps a hydra-like organism, um, uh, also has 
these molecules and also learns and stores information. And the same molecules are present in sponges, which don't even have a nervous system, but they're, you know, they're still sort of quasi animals, but they are the first animals, so to speak. Um, and so where did sponges come from? Well, sponges um, are, being the first animal, are a group that diverged from single cell colonies of eukaryotic protozoa. So a eukaryote you know, is a cell that has a, a nucleus with the membrane enclosed in, uh, in a, um, so with the nucleus enclosed within a membrane inside the cytoplasm. And these were the first sexually reproducing organisms, um, this whole group of protists. And they, in order, they were also the, also the first predators in nature. So to protect themselves, they would form these colonies where you know there's the safety in numbers kind of thing, and some of them would specialize in uh, uh, locomotion, some in feeding, and some of the cells would specialize in uh, reproduction. So it was like an organism, but it was an organism of convenience because they're just clinging together. Any one cell can defect and go live out on its own because it's got all of the genetic equipment to make the survival capacities it needs. So it's just due to sort of gene suppression by the group, you know, it kind of is a pattern that get, works out that some cells will reproduce and others will feed and others will look them up. But once that cell leaves the colony, it has all those capacities again. But in a multicellular organism, those things, in a real multicellular organism, those things are built in to our genetic code, the, the, our genome starts out in the egg that gets fertilized, and so you have the mixing of the, the genes of the father and the mother, and out of that fertilized egg comes the program for an entire organism. Now you, you take a skin cell off of your, your body and put it somewhere, it's going to die, because it needs everything it, that it lives with. You know, we can't, uh, our mind can't work without our brain, our brain can't work without our heart pumping uh, oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, uh, blood, and, and the heart can't work without the lungs uh, extracting oxygen and giving it to the bloodstream. So we are a fully integrated organism, and our cells don't easily um, live when taken out. I mean, you can create, you know, fake life situations where you could keep them alive, but in nature they don't live alive like that. So um, protozoa have these same the single cell protozoa have these, some of these same molecules yeah. and they learn and store information. They undergo plas, uh, plasticity, uh, not plasticity, synaptic, uh, they, they don't have synaptic, they undergo <laughs> uh, classical conditioning, uh, sensitization, um, you know, um, habituation, all of the things that you see in, in primitive kinds of animals. And so they were, they, when they were first discovered, the protozoa were thought to be animals. Uh, because they were so motile and active uh, when, when seen through a microscope. And so they were called, you know, protozoa, first animals, beginning of the first animal. But now animal, an animal has to be a multicellular organism that starts from a single cell egg that's fertilized. Um, so protozoa have these behaviors and they have molecules, but they don't have a nervous system. Mm -hmm. And yet they have plasticity molecules that they use to learn. So learning and behavior have nothing to do with the nervous system fundamentally. They're just part of one's you know, survival toolkit. Uh, and that's true whether you're a single cell or a multi-cell. Now, you know, the protozoa came from a fusion of two, uh, I'm sorry, the, you know, the protozoa came from the fusion of uh, two prokaryotic cells, which, in which the, nuclear, the uh, DNA is free-floating in, uh, in the cytoplasm. There's no nucleus. Um, so these, these uh, bacterial cells also learn, they, they approach and avoid danger, and they learn about danger. Um, so learning is as old as life. Bacteria the, uh, are the living example of the beginning of life. We don't know, there was probably you know, some time between the beginning of life and what ended up being bacteria, but the beginning of life is characterized by the name LUCA, last uh, uh, universal common ancestor of all of life. Uh, but LUCA was probably not one cell, but a, a kind of cell um, that, that uh, was able to survive long enough to reproduce and generate the entire history of life. But where did that cell come from? So that 
involved a lot of biological experimentation in the in the oceans of uh, early Earth, uh, sometime around you know, seven uh, 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, you have these experimentations going on. And obviously there were lots of experiments before one happened to hit that had, what, it's not that everything stopped at that point, but you had a cell that could reproduce itself. So it lived long enough to reproduce itself. Uh, and it, uh, it, it produced a, an offspring that could reproduce itself as well. You know, it's been said that every bacterial cell that ever lives, ever lived in the history of life, ha is, a, is a descendant of that one cell because it's all about cell division. So if you've got a cell dividing and it divides and you know, it just keeps dividing, it all has to go back to that one cell. So it's kind of interesting that that, back to, that first bacterial cell is immortal because it lives on in the divisions of other cells. It's not like sexual reproduction where it's a, a brand new cell. It's the same cell, it just divides in half, divides in half, divides in half. They get their genetic diversity uh, by picking up uh, pieces of genes in their surroundings. So it's called uh, uh, horizontal uh, um, transmission of genes rather than vertical. So vertical is from parent to offspring, and horizontal is you just pick up stuff. So they get some like that, and they also have mutations. So it's not like every bacterial cell has the same genome. They, they are different because of all these processes. But yeah, there were, there were probably lots of experiments going on between the Big Bang's chemicals arriving on Earth, and um, you, know, you have the, the entire process of physical chemistry where there's no biology yet. You know, let's say five billion years ago, there's no biology. The Earth is cooled enough to where there's water, and you have some, you know, you have carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and, uh, and other kinds of um, molecules that are, have been collected from the Big Bang. And these form a kind of organic chemistry at some point where, um, you know, there's no biochemistry at this point because there's no DNA or RNA. But, at, but then at some point you get kind of physical self-replication, autocatalytic uh, pr um, um, processes of metabolism that keep going to keep the cell, the cell uh, um, physiologically, it's not a cell, the, the, this collection of, of chemicals physiologically kind of uh, reproducing or catalytically reproducing itself. Um, and then that process then um, gets trapped in the pore of a vent in the ocean. This is a, a theory by the uh, biologist at University College London called Nick Lane. And the idea is that you have cracks in the ocean floor and the water seeps, the cool water of the ocean seeps into these cracks. And then it's now running deep under the ocean floor where you know, the next layer down is the magma, which is hot, so it gets warmed up a bit and also warmed by the, the kind of the catalytic currents that are there. And it, uh, it makes its way, and there are these other things, the, these um, uh, vents that are other cracks that that's, uh, rise, they're made out of um, minerals and they rise up into the ocean floor. And so the cool water comes in, it gets warm, the warm water goes into these vents and the carbonate walls of these vents have all kinds of minerals in them. And so the warm water releases some of that. And one of the things that, that was released was uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and these formed little bubbles in the, in the area. But what had happened first is the, some uh, kind of RNA or DNA got tr free floating RNA. I think it's free floating, it must have been, uh, got trapped in like a kind of, you know, the wall is not smooth, it's not a man made thing, it's not smooth, so it's got these little pockets in it. And the RNA gets trapped in there, and the hydrogen bubbles seals it, you know, sealing it in. And so it's a kind, it's what's called a protocell. It's, it doesn't have a membrane, but it's got a DNA that can replicate and make proteins, uh, and um, um, begins to and, and construct lipids and so forth. And so you get a growth of uh, a surrounding on the cell with the DNA in there. And it 
then can move through the hydrogen and sulfide uh, bubbles and up into the ocean and live alone and reproduce. Yeah. And voila. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a story. It's, this is yeah. not, um, it's a hypothesis and uh, there are lots of parts of it that are probably uh, controversial. If you get into the nitty gritty or if any field, you find controversy. But, you know, Nick, K Nick um, Lane's theory, not Nick Cave in the Bad Seas, Nick, Net Nick Lane, the, <laughs> the biologist's theory, is um, that the, uh, the, this is how it all happened, this kind of warm water fostering the release of these carbon things. And, you know, other people have other theories. So I just mentioned that as one possible way that the magic could have happened that, that made a cell that could live on its own. So, yeah, I, I didn't really, I didn't start at the bottom. I started with us and rats and mice and asking questions about how far back danger goes. It took me all the way to the beginning of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very well. interesting. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing that I would like to ask you is, is the ability to form representations and to use them to guide behavior important in the sort of story that you presented in your book? And how far back do we have to go to find yeah. that ability? Well, um, you know, the, Again, we're dealing with controversial topics because uh, <clears throat> there a lot of, uh, I guess the, the key leverage point we should work from here on this question is um, the procedure of instrumental goal-directed learning, learning that is based on uh, the outcome of an action. Mm -hmm. So this is a process, this process is acquired through trial and error. So an organism will, um, you know, in the classic example, like uh, Thorndike um, in the 1890s, put a rat, I'm uh, sorry, a cat in a puzzle box. It's a puzzle box because if the rat pushes the right lever or pulls the string, the door opens and he gets food. So the rat has been food deprived, so he's motivated to get out of the box. So, you know, the first time he's in the box, he's just making random movements, nothing happens. but you know, his, his hunger, his need to eat is there, and he bumps something and the door opens. So he goes out and eats. The next time, you know, he stored a, a, a memory that bumping the door, it's not like, oh, I bought the door. It's, it's kind of more of an implicit kind of memory that that action was reinforced. Therefore, <clears throat> that action uh, is repeated in the, next, in the next time. Now, if you do that process over and over again, eventually, uh, it becomes what's called a habit. So it starts out being goal-directed. In other words, uh, it depends on the reward coming with the behavior that you produce. Yeah. But once it becomes habitual, a person or an animal begins to repeat the behavior, even if it's no longer rewarding. I mean, the classic example is drug addiction, where it's become habitual, the, the initial learning uh, has moved out of the goal-directed region of the striatum and has moved into the habitual region of the striatum, which is not as easily um, modified because it's, it's, you know, that's just the way that part works. It's a habit. Now, habits can be a good thing. Um, you do, you develop habits in your life so that you don't have to, you know, plan everything and, and relearn everything every time you do them. Um, but then the habits can also become very bad. But the reason we, you know, you get this kind of partitioned area off of a habit, I think, is because once you've learned a useful habit, uh, you don't want it to change. I mean, it's, if it's useful to the organism, you want to keep doing it. So uh, in the 1980s, I would say, uh, Tony Dickinson, Anthony Dickinson at uh, Cambridge um, was able to come up with behavioral procedures that could separate a habit from a goal-directed action. Now, the reason you have to do that is because looking at the behavior, they look identical. You know, the rat, or the uh, uh, cat, whatever the animal is, will uh, open the door to get the food. Uh, or we'll, we'll open the door anyway. I mean, they, the usual thing is you put them in a runway and, you know, they, they run to the end, even if the food is not there. Uh, if, if it's a habit, 
but if if it's a uh, goal directed behavior, if they get there and there's no food, and that happens a few times, then they stop doing it. So, but uh, but you know the, the trick that that Dickinson figured out was a way to um, show that internal representations of the goal are what underlies the, the goal directed uh, habit, because he could uh, take the the animal and devalue the goal by making the animal nauseous when he ate the food. Yeah. So the goal is now not of value anymore. So if the, if the rat continues to perform the behavior, despite the fact that the goal is no longer valuable, it's a habit. If, if making the rat nauseous in relation to the goal uh, ceases the behavior, then it's goal direct. So um, that was a, a phenomenal um, piece of research that Dickinson did, and he and Bernard Bailene really kind of uh, put that whole story on the map in the 90s, uh, and, and it's a very uh, important distinction, because the way that um, researchers have tradition, both of those behaviors, by the way, the habit and the goal-directed behavior, are what's called instrumental behavior. The behavior is at least initially instrumental in obtaining the reward. Um, so what's happened over the years is instrumental behavior has been viewed as a sign of intelligence, of, of goal-directed, uh, motivated, high-level kind of processing. But Dickinson's um, uh, uh, studies were able to show that habits are very primitive. The reason that's important is because, for example, in invertebrates, people have used these instrumental behaviors to show that habits, uh, to show that the, the animals can perform instrumental behavior, and therefore they're goal directed. But uh, what what we've learned from the Dickinson kind of approach, for example, is that uh, you can't tell from the behavior itself. You've got to run these tests. Now, um, one uh, one important thing is that if you go to the the uh, reptiles, the, you know, the predecessors of uh, mammals, they don't have instrumental goal-directed behavior. They learn these behaviors, but they learn them as habits from the beginning. They don't go through the goal-directed stage. Interesting, uh, te uh, teenagers do that as well, and human teenagers. They can go through a habit stage without having any goal directed, and that has important implications for, you know, the erratic behavior of teenagers, for example. Um, anyway, so the, the, uh, I think what's going on, and this, I have the literature I reviewed in the book on this, uh, there was one paper particularly important, a researcher who had been claiming goal-directed behavior in invertebrates um, came to the conclusion that it, it's not goal-directed because he, under, he began to understand the intricacies of what's required for goal-directed behavior. And he said that there are simpler, uh, one of the things he found was that the mechanisms underlying, for example, goal, what seemed to be goal-directed instrumental behavior in an invertebrate, I forget what he was working with, say it's a grasshopper, I don't know. Um, uh, the biological mechanisms were the same as those that it used for like uh, classical conditioning or sensitization. So he said that to me that suggests that the instrumental response is not a cognitive one, but a kind of more mechanistic one. It's more like a habit than a goal-directed behavior. So in general, you know, the instrumental goal-directed behavior is viewed as something that mammals were able to do that reptiles couldn't. Now birds also can do it, which is interesting. And the question is, is that because there was a reptilian ancestor that actually you know, that's extinct now, but that actually gave that to both birds and mammals, uh, or did mammals come up with it on their own? Now, um, when you get to birds, you get to the question of episodic memory, because that's been a very, very controversial uh, topic in the study of birds. Um, and so the, the early work was based on the idea that bird, uh, you know, the, the research suggested that birds have um, memory for what, where, and when, which are the three kind of pillars of episodic memory. 
So then it was assumed that birds have episodic memory and therefore have consciousness because in humans, episodic memories are conscious. But the thing you have to know about human episodic memory is that it's not conscious until you retrieve it into consciousness. You know, all your episodic memories, uh, you know, if I say, what did you eat for breakfast? Now it's a conscious memory. But it wasn't, you weren't conscious of it at that moment. So mem episodic memory depends on a mechanism of retrieving that stored information in a way that a human can be conscious of it. But if, a, you know, for a human consciousness is unconscious until the fraction of a second when it's conscious. So there's a lot of cognitive processing that's going on that's not conscious until that. So unless the birds have that, you know, they could still have these kind of complex representation. But the other problem is that uh, one, one issue is that it, there's no evidence that they have a unified what, where, when representation. They might have, for example, semantic what, semantic where, semantic when, that they can show behaviorally in, in various tests, uh, and because you have to test those separate processes. But whether they have a full-blown episodic memory is not clear, and even the the, uh, the leading people in that field, for example, Nikki Clayton at, at Cambridge, and also she worked with Dickinson as well on this, um, have taken to talking about episodic-like memory um, to just to make sure that the reader doesn't think that they're talking about the birds have a conscious uh, personal uh, memory because they can mentally time travel to the past and future. Uh, this is a, the quality of episodic memory that Endel Tolkien, who invented episodic memory, uh, says is the, the key to human episodic memory, is that it's a platform that we use to mentally visit our past. Not the past, but my past, or your past. You visit your past, and you visit your future, not a hypothetical past or a hypothetical future, but yours, you know. Um, so it's not any old past and any old future which is important because the past can be a semantic representation. In order for it to be your past, you have to be part of that representation. Yourself has to be part of that. And without that, it's not a, an episodic trip to the past or to the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let me ask you another question now. Uh, you talk a lot about emotions in the book and you have a particular approach to them. I mean, basically, you criticize some of the ways people think, talk about, and write about emotions. Uh, could you tell us about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of this I'm criticizing myself because I used to talk about that as well. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry that, that I'm giving long answers, but it no, no it. So, you know, the way I got started on emotion research was um, through the PhD work I did with Michael Kazaniga on split brain patients in the 1970s. And <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> what, what we were studying were patients in whom the two hemispheres had been separated, the, the fibers connecting them had been separated to control epilepsy. And these patients are were well known at the time, and this was like 1974 when we were studying that all of the details of what a split brain patient is had been uh, discovered by Mike when he was working with Sperry at Caltech in the 60s. So we were trying to go beyond, you know, what happens when you take the brain apart. You know, what what can that what can the split brain tell us about um, how our minds normally work? So we uh, <clears throat> we didn't, you know, we were just. We were trying all kinds of different tests, uh, higher cognition and stuff. And one test in particular was uh, quite striking. So um, we put, we gave the, the patient a stimulus on the left side of this visual space and the right side. And um, let's see if I, I always forget what was on the left and the right. So, um, okay, so on the right side was a snow scene. Mm -hmm. uh, no, sorry. Oh, the right side was a chicken flaw. Okay. On the 
left side uh, was a, a, a snow scene. So we're talking to the left hemisphere because that's where the language capacities are. And we said, uh, and we put out a bunch of pictures and said, you know, point. And so uh, each hand pointed to a stimulus. And he said, why'd you do that? So now the left hemisphere is talking. Well, I saw a chicken claw. So I pointed to the chicken, left hand, oh, sorry, right, right hand, left hemisphere, uh, pointed right hand, sky to the left hemisphere. The chicken claw was out here on the, in the right visual field, one to the left hemisphere. So the right hand pointed to the chicken. The, uh, uh, and he said, well, I, you need a shovel to clean out the chicken yard. So um, the chicken pin. Actually, I think he said chicken shit, but you know, so maybe we just made that up after the fact. So, so um, the uh, what happened was the left, the right hemisphere had no knowledge of the snow scene. So the, the right, I'm sorry, the right hemisphere saw the snow scene. The left hemisphere had no knowledge of the snow scene, and so it made up a story. It told a narrative that made its behavior look sense. I saw a chicken claw, so I pointed to the chicken. And you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. So we said, well, wow, that, that's interesting. Uh, maybe that's what we do every day in our life. We, we don't always know, I, like, you know, I just waved my hand. You don't always have internal understanding of every behavior you do. And it's very disturbing to our conscious minds, which are very sensitive to cognitive dissonance. If, for our body to be producing a behavior that our conscious mind doesn't know anything about. So consciousness has found a way to narrate life in each of us so that our life makes sense because we don't understand most of what's going on. We use a little bit of information and turn that into a narrative. And th you know that's how politicians can gain control over people by creating narratives that affect their lives uh, and telling a story that uh, that can make sense in the culture in which that story was generated. So um, we were at the bar that night, and um, we because we'd go there after you know after doing these studies and just chat about things, and <clears throat> we were talking. Said, well, you know, maybe uh, emotional systems are the systems that are generating a lot of these behaviors that we need to explain because emotion systems may be kind of you know unconsciously controlled, and so. When we see ourselves acting in a certain way, we interpret ourselves, it's kind of a we and James uh, sort of idea, you know, that we use our behavior to, to uh, our body and behavior to tell us what to feel. Uh, kind of Damasio is S too. Um, and that's, uh, um, I said, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I said, you know, I'm, yeah, I've always been interested in emotion. I said, well, you should really pursue that because there isn't any research going on in emotion right now. And it's true, the field was barren. Uh, brain mechanisms of emotion, not, not much was going on. There were still a few people kind of left over from the um, rewarding self-stimulation age kind of doing stuff or people doing, you know, motivational studies like hunger and thirst or sexual beha uh, behavior. Uh, <clears throat> there were some people still stimulating brain areas and eliciting behaviors kind of in the Darwinian mode of uh, basic emotions. Uh, Jak Pengsepp, for example, was, uh, was uh, involved in all of that kind of work. Uh, now, Pengsepp stimulated the brain and found lots of areas where he could elicit behaviors, and he labeled those as emotion centers. Um, but for, uh, so when I came into this field, um, what attracted me was the possibility of not using innate stimuli or innate stimulation of any kind of uh, but to use some kind of learning procedure. That way, you would know how the animal acquired its emotional response. So we took a very standard procedure, fear conditioning, give a tone to the rat, pair it with a shock one time, and then the rat will freeze. And then what I was in a lab that uh, was concerned with high blood pressure and the, and the control of that by the brain. So the boss of the lab said, well, you can do whatever you want, you just have to record blood pressure. So I learned how to cannulate uh, the blood vessels of a rat and record their blood pressure uh, and heart rate through that. And so we would uh, give the tone, pair it with a shot, and then uh, give next, the next day put the rat in a new chamber where there was no 
context uh, reminders of, of that situation and play the tone. Well, we put the rat in the chamber and the rat would start moving around. Then we'd play the tone and he would freeze. And we were recording blood pressure and heart rate at the time and they would both shoot up. So we had freezing behavior, blood pressure and heart rate. And, you know, it seemed like a pretty good set of responses. And then I decided to go looking in the brain. So I said, well, we've got an auditory stimulus that is eliciting these responses. So maybe we can follow the pathway from the ear into the brain. Because at that time, the techniques for axonal transport and mapping of, of uh, nerve connections in the brain was brand new. And I'd learned a little bit about that in graduate school. And so I started, um, uh, said, well, where's, well, let's, let's figure out where the auditory cortex in the rat was. So we lesioned the, uh, we put a, a, the tracer in the auditory thalamus that went to the auditory cortex. So that told us where it was because nobody had identified the auditory cortex in the rat precisely. So we lesioned that and the animals still learn. Okay. Because everybody thought you know, the cortex would be necessary for learning. Yeah. Uh, so we said, well, how about if we lesion the medial geniculate, the lower level that's connecting to the auditory cortex? Uh, and that disrupted learning. And also going down further to all other stages, disrupted learning. So you need, the, the stimulus has to go to the thalamus, but not to the cortex. So we went back to our injections in the thalamus, and we saw not only did it go to the auditory cortex, but also to the amygdala. And the amygdala had a kind of history associated with fear and so forth in epileptic patients. And so we, uh, you know, we, we said, okay, maybe it's going directly to the amygdala from the thalamus. That was kind of, you know, unheard of at the time that you could bypass the cortex. And the Freudians got really excited because this, you know, we promoted it as an unconscious processing of fear. <clears throat> and, um, but, you know, really what it was, was an unconscious processing of the threat. But I called it fear because I was joining a new field and that's what they called it. Um, <clears throat> but in my mind, I had, I was thinking of our split brain patients the whole time that, you know, the amygdala was now this unconscious fear center that's triggering these responses. And if the rat could be conscious, I don't know if he is or not, but if he could be conscious, he would be interpreting those behavioral and body signs to come up with the conscious feeling. Um, so a popular idea at the time was implicit versus explicit memory. So I said, okay, the amygdala is an implicit fear center, implicit fear learning center. And so that's, that keeps it clean. Uh, so in humans, we have implicit and explicit fear, but in rats, all we can do is study implicit fear. But over the years, you know, I was never very precise about all this. I wrote about it in my books, I, you know, I include it. But in my lectures, I would talk about the amygdalas. You know, see, I wrote a song, you know, the uh, all in the nut, the, uh, the amygdala. Why do we feel so afraid? It's because of the amygdala, basically, it said. Um, <clears throat> so I wasn't so, you know, I'm not guilt-free in all of this process. And I would be introduced and introduced to someone who had shown how the amygdala feels fear in all of us, you know, over and over again. And all over the papers, the, you know, the amygdala fear center was growing. My book, The Emotional Brain, did a lot to promote the amygdala fear center idea, even though in it I said, you know, it's implicit, but, you know, implicit, nobody cared about implicit, explicit, it was just, it's fear, you know. Um, and part of the reason is that words are very powerful. If you say fear, people think you're talking about fear. Not about right. some kind of you know, more primitive little thing. You know, this psychologist in the 1950s said, you know, the common language is full of, full of all these uh, quasi-psychological terms. When we use them, we're, you know, we're projecting our mental states onto the organism that you're using them about. Um, and so even though psychologists uh, in the 1950s and 60s were talking about brain areas in terms of intervening variables, you know, the implicit kind of, uh, I would say, non-subjective physiological states that connect a threat with a response. Um, that state came to be called a fear state. So the whole point of using the intervening variable to be more objective is lost when you apply the name fear to that, because the part of the brain that you label as fear or hunger or whatever acquires the subjective uh, baggage all of the baggage, semantic baggage, of the word fear or hunger.
like Nico Tinberg and the father of ethology said, you know, uh, ideas about uh, uh, the subjective states of other animals in relation to fear and hunger and so forth are mere speculations because we only can know the subjective states through introspection. You know, the difference between studying a human and studying a rat is you can ask a human what's on their mind. So a human can respond verbally, oh, I'm afraid, or non-verbally, point to uh, the word fear or point to something, some stimulus. Uh, and well, let me give you a simple example. You show a picture of an apple subliminally, right? So the apple goes to the person's brain and uh, you say, what did you see? The person said, I didn't see anything because the stimulus was presented briefly in, in mass. Uh, but the person can point to the apple. So there was, a, there was a registration, subconscious registration of the picture that allowed the person to identify what was seen, even though the person couldn't talk about it. But if you take away all the, the tricks and just present the apple to the person, the person can point to it if, you, if that's what you want them to do. But they can also say, I saw an apple. So if we're conscious of something, we can respond verbally or non-verbally. If we're not conscious of it, we can only respond non-verbally. The problem is other animals can only respond non-verbally. So we do, it's, this is like the, you know, the Dickinson experiment. It looks the same from the outside. Uh, the rat looks the same, whether it's habitual or um, goal-directed. can't just be term, determined by behavior. You've got to have more information. And we don't have that in, in other animals uh, for, in terms of um, emotions. So uh, I want also to ask you about the triune brain model because that was very prevalent, let's say, until recently. And I, uh, so, uh, now and then I, I also hear people talking about the triune brain model, but in the book you present some problems that it has. So right. what about it? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I've... Uh, I think in 1991 or two is when I first started writing um, about the problems with the limbic system and triune brain uh, concept of Paul McLean. You know, it, it was a, in its time, it was a, a fantastic, uh, insightful putting together of a lot of information. Um, but it, it was based on some false assumptions or inaccurate assumptions about the evolution of the mammalian brain. So in McLean's model, the, uh, the uh, mammals or the invented cortex themselves. Reptiles and birds have no cortex. So in the, in, um, in, when mammals came along, that's the first time cortex appeared. Uh, and so you have this old cortex in rodents and other primitive mammals. And then in primates, you have this new cortex, neocortex. Of course, the wrink, that's the wrinkle stuff you see when you see a picture of the brain. The medial cortex, the old cortex is in the medial uh, hemisphere, it's like the hot dog bun, you pull it apart, and the two white parts that are toasted in the middle. That's where the medial uh, cerebral cortex is. So he said these old cortical areas um, are our visceral brain, our limbic system, and are the source of all of our uh, emotions. And we therefore, like Darwin said, we've inherited our emotions from our animal ancestors. Um, <clears throat> so with this idea though, um, th that idea ran into trouble. Um, well, let, let me go on. So what, what he said the limbic system was, was an emotion system. Um, and it was not, it, it's, its goal, its, pro, its function was emotion and not cognition, whereas the neocortex's function was cognition and not emotion. But in 1956, just a few years after, McLean put that idea out, and oh, and so one time, the centerpiece of the limbic system was the hippocampus. He said that the uh, magnocellular, the, the large pyramidal cells of the uh, dentate gyrus are the keyboards on which the environment plays its emotional tunes. And it was very poetic and beautifully written and well argued from Gibson what he knew at the time. Um, 
But soon thereafter, you know, so the hippocampus should be emotional and not cognitive, according to the limbic system theory. But the hippocampus became the centerpiece of the whole, you know, explicit cognitive memory system um, uh, in 1956, starting then. Um, so that shouldn't be the case if the, um, uh, you know, if the uh, limbic system is involved in emotion and not cognition. And we now know that the neocortex is you know, very involved in, in uh, emotions. So uh, there, were, there were conceptual problems, but there were also in, um, uh, evolutionary uh, neurobiology problems. So the forerunners of uh, neocortex and old cortex are present in reptiles and birds. So it's not something that just happened when mammals occurred. This is something that had been slowly building over the course of evolution. It didn't fully manifest itself until uh, we had, um, until mm -hmm. mammals arrived. Uh, <clears throat> another problem was that the idea was that uh, um, uh, goal-directed behavior required, uh, uh, it was a sign of consciousness, uh, of conscious emotion, because the reason an animal um, worked to get food is because they like, they enjoyed the taste of it afterwards. In other words, it was a kind of hedonic theory of uh, emotion. And, um, you know, I think that that in itself is problematic because we don't have any um, good evidence that can prove that what the animal is experiencing. I'm sure it's experiencing something. Um, but uh, maybe this is a good point to for me to uh, talk uh, in a few minutes uh, to talk about. I didn't say what my theory of consciousness was. I said what. Uh, yeah, that, that was basically my last question. Yeah, about but, consciousness. But that, that's going to come back to um, to the limbic system. Uh, remind me to get back there at the end. So uh, I'll uh, put it in the context of um, um, what the cortex does in emotion. So my theory of emotion, and one that I share with uh, some colleagues, such as, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze, <laughs> uh, Hakuan Lau, a good, good friend and colleague at UCLA. Um, uh, to some extent, my views overlap with uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett. Uh, I'm not the, I'm not a full-fledged constructionist in in her brand of that theory, but I have embraced a kind of uh, cognitive interpretation view of emotions uh, since the early days of um, when I was coming up with these hypotheses in this foot brain patients. So I've been a cognitive theorist of emotion for a long time. And usually in my books, including like as old as the emotional brain, I talked about the conscious experience of emotion as being uh, dependent upon processes like working memory in which the uh, brain is able to assemble Disparate, dis, desperate, disparate kinds of information into a coherent representation. And I said the, the difference between emotion and cognition, and that's in, and just regular old cognition, is that the uh, working memory system is working with different information when there's an emotional stimulus. If you're looking at just a, a picture of an apple that has no meaning to you, then you'll have visual cortex and some semantic memory that's required to recognize that object. And that's what working memory will work with. If it's a picture of uh, an apple that uh, made you sick in the past, then in addition to visual cortex and semantic memory being used by working memory to create a representation, you might have um, you know, visceral reactions and nausea uh, reminders that, that enter into that. And so the cortex is probably going to be involved in feeding up into working memory. So the idea is that we have a, a, a cortical consciousness network that puts together information about for a conscious experience um, and is involved in all kinds of conscious experiences. It, it just does it differently uh, in different kinds of conscious experiences because it's using different information uh, to put that kind of experience together. And <clears throat> there are a couple of uh, twists to, to this theory of, con of emotional consciousness. One, that it requires um, a self-schema to be involved. This is like episodic memory. In order for it to be personal, you have to be there. So for fear, I say, no self, no fear. And that's my 
t-shirt here, no self, no fear. Uh, and it's on the book website, which is a little merch section where you can get the t-shirt. There's also out an album um, called Songs of Life, uh, which is free. Download those for free. Uh, josephledoux.com uh, so joseph-ledoux.com you can find the book stuff there. yeah I, I will include that <laughs> in the description box so. so anyway so no self no fear that means you have to have a self representation in working memory um, but you also need another kind of representation a, a an emotion schema so an emotion schema is a body of knowledge of everything you've learned about that emotion throughout your life uh, so in the presence of you know, some stimulus like a threat, uh, you will begin to, uh, semantic memory will begin to activate your emotion schema, drawing up memories about threat and danger, your relationship to danger self, so episodic memories are coming into the emotion schema. And all of a sudden, you have a, a kind of template of your fear experience. It's the, you, you know, as I said, everything until the last fraction of a second in front of a, uh, of a conscious state is unconscious. So all of this self schema, emotion schema stuff is building up a kind of template of what your, um, your immediate experience is going to be. It's going to be different in every kind of situation. But because it is your emotion schema and your self schema that's organizing all this, your fear is going to be different from everyone else's fear in the world. And because what you learn about your fear, you learn in the culture in which you grew up. Uh, your cultural fear is going to, your, 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 the fear, your fear schema, your fear experience is going to be based on your cultural experience of fear. Uh, and so there are two factors that make everyone's uh, emotions different. One is their, the culture in which they grew up uh, and which they learn their fear and self schemas. So, you know, we think Darwin said, you know, fear is universal, and there's still a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, point in, in say basic emotions theory, but I say what's universal is danger. Every, danger is present everywhere, so every culture uh, is going to experience danger, and they're going to have a word for danger, the experiences that their people have for danger. So, so let's say you were, I don't know you live some uh, somewhere in a remote area in New Zealand or something, uh, you probably have your culture has a word for what happens when you're in danger. And if you put that into a translator, it will translate that into fear if you put it into an English translator. And so you say, well, they, both cultures have fear, so they must have the same experience because fear is universal. It's been inherited from animals. Um, but what that shows is simply that the word, the word for danger can be translated. This is why we have so many problems, for example, at the UN, you have translation of language across languages, uh, you can match the words, so you think everybody has the same experience. But two people from different cultures are going to have a different experience of those same semantic words, because the semantics are different in each culture. The underlying kind of connotation is, is different. The denotation may be the same, but the connotations and the underlying meaning is going to be very different. So emotions are these cognitive representations, constructions of of what's happening to you uh, based on a kind of non-conscious narrative that's building up as part of that template and giving consciousness its starting point. Now once the information is in conscious, another narrative can begin to be generated to uh, uh, explain our, you know, the situations we're in and our behaviors and so forth. So it's all about like keeping your mind consonant, reducing dissonance and preventing uh, stress and so forth, and when when we are unable to con, you know to tell a narrative story of our emotions in a way that is good for us, we begin to um, uh, have problems with it. You know, when we start to fear our fears, for example. Mm -hmm. So you know, just to go back to the the limbic system, uh, it didn't allow for this kind of cognitive involvement uh, in emotion that I think is uh, essential in this becoming more and more central to the uh, idea of emotions uh, in science. So I think that kind of covers uh, pretty much what we had talked about talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you want to include something 
uh, now at the end about the limbic system, you said you wanted to go back to it. Well, I, yeah, I kind of did that with the, the last comment about the, the limbic system doesn't allow for that kind of cognitive uh, involvement in emotion. Emotions are, uh, uh, you know, part of this older, ancient brain, uh, not the cognitive brain. Uh, and so I think that that was a mistake. You know, the first name of uh, the that McLean used for all these circuits was the visceral brain uh, because his main goal at first was to understand how the how um, uh, a thought could impact uh, the, the physiology of the body and lead to high blood pressure you know, and, and uh, asthma uh, and ulcers so he thought of those as you know psychosomatic diseases I mean, you know, now ulcers are thought to be due to a bacterial problem, but still there's some stress involved. How can the, how could the, uh, the conscious mind, uh, you know, lead to these kinds of pathological conditions, uh, was his question. And he said, well, the neocortex isn't connected with the hypothalamus, so it can't. But the old cortex is strongly connected with the hypothalamus, so that's where we, we get the unconscious uh, emotions that are uh, now... Freudian and you know, the, this was the seat of the limbic system was the seat of the id and, and all of that. Um, but if, you know, by, by starting out by calling all this the visceral brain, I think he was on the right track because all these structures do interact and control the viscera uh, and the body. So it is a visceral nervous system, it's just not a, an emotion system. Emotions are cognitive interpretations and when we're cognitively uh, interpreting things, one of the things we interpret is our viscera. You know, and my good friend Antonio Damasio emphasizes the body feedback aspects of all this, and that's certainly important. But you know, he says, well, if the body feedback's not there, though, we can simulate it mentally, and uh, with an as if loop. But for me, all emotions are as if loops. We don't need any of that stuff. All we need is a, uh, a cognitive interpretation that we believe. We're in an emotional situation. Some people are emotional, but are physiologically flatlining. So it's 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 not a necessary component. People with amygdala damage can still feel fear. So all of that uh, I think needs some rethinking, and um, I'm trying to put it together in a more cognitive way. Maybe I go too far, you know. Uh, but sometimes we don't go too far. Nobody listens. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I really believe that the, the cognitive aspect of all this is uh, is essential. You need the other stuff, but it's kind of like the um, the, the body stuff to me is more the uh, uh, it's like volume knob. You know? So you go to a restaurant and ask the waiter to turn the music down because it's too loud. It's the same song that you hate, and you still hate it, but it's not as loud, not as annoying. It's kind of that's what medications often do. They don't make you feel less fearful or anxious to kind of turn down the volume. Okay, so Dr. Ludo, we're, we are reaching our time limit. Okay. Uh, would you like to mention any other places on the internet where people can find you? Uh, on Twitter, I'm the amygdaloid. Um, and you said you'd put my personal website up there and uh, we have uh, amygdaloids.com. That's where the, the band information can be found. And as I said, Go to the website for the book, um, and uh, you'll see free music there and a, and a T-shirt you can purchase if you want. Okay, thank great. you, Ricardo. It's been a pleasure. Okay, it's been a, it's my pleasure, and thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to consider making a pledge on Patreon. I have the link in the description box or on PayPal. You can also find the links there. And uh, otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and eat the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters on PayPal, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perro Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunde, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Bissell, David Diaz, Anian Kata,
Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arnold Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert uh, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Max Bailby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Paulo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Ber Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslam Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Staten T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yacila Deza Araújo, Ethan Solon, Romain Roch, Dmitry Grigoriev, and Diego Londonio Correa, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardas Friends, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.